The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the homely for the 12th Sunday in the Ordinary Time. Uh, finally, we are back to the Ordinary Time. Uh, we have been celebrating solemnities, first Pentecost, second uh, Holy Trinity, and finally Corpus Christi last Sunday. The theme that I've chosen for this uh, weekend, for this Sunday, is My Father, uh, based on uh, the weekend celebrations, Father's Day. So happy uh, Father's Day to all the fathers. Thomas Aquinas, my brothers and sisters, is one of the greatest intellectuals uh, in the Catholic Church. In the 13th century, he talked about the three faculties of human being, the faculty of intellect, faculty of will, and faculty of emotions or passions or feelings. I, I frequently talk about it because it's very, very important. Uh, the best way to understand these three faculties is like comparing yourself to a car. Uh, the faculty of the intellect, it is more like the brake. Uh, the faculty of the will is the steering uh, uh, wheel, and the faculty of uh, emotions is the accelerator. Accelerator is very important, but you, it has to be controlled by will and uh, the intellect. That is, uh, if you don't let them, then emotions will first it will hit someone or hurt someone. Uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, elaborately talked about it. If you get an opportunity, please read it. In the scriptures, we have uh, three enemies mentioned in Ephesians and as well as chapter 1 first, first John chapter 2. Uh, three enemies. What are the three enemies? We all know the f world, the flesh, and the devil. So uh, the things in the world, being attached to the things in the world, and the flesh, desires of the flesh. And finally, the devil. These are the three enemies. You might be wondering, why am I talking about Thomas Aquinas, the three faculties and the three enemies? In today's gospel reading is a very important reading. Actually, Jesus is sending the apostles. Uh, before sending them for the ministry, he warns them. And then he's also preparing them. Um, you know, so far, you would see in the Matthew's gospel, only Jesus had been the one who was preaching and doing the ministry, healing ministry. Uh, but not the apostles, but now he's preparing them and he's warning them that uh, the, the enemies are there to attack them, so not to be scared of them. So let me read out to you this particular verse, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. So uh, let's try to compare and then see the world of flesh and Satan opposite is the will, emotions, and intellect. If you carefully, patiently uh, listen to the words of Jesus, you would see that he's talking about two kinds of fear. That is why one, say, one side he says, do not be afraid. And another way side he says, be afraid. So what is he talking about here is two kinds of fear, the rational fear and intellectual fear. And that fear you will be able to understand when you apply the Thomas Aquinas three faculties. Uh, the rational fear, you know, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. He's talking about God who can uh, let us go to the, to the hell. And uh, here he's talking about the rational fear. There is fear of offending God. You know, God loves you no matter what. He cares for you. Why do you want to offend him? So don't offend him. Don't be afraid. Uh, be afraid of uh, offending him. That is the kind of fear that he's talking about, rational fear. There is another fear is irrational fear. Uh, that is, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. The three enemies that I said, the world, the flesh, and the Satan, they are not going to kill you. The world is not going to come and kill you unless and otherwise there is a, another planet coming and hitting the hitting our world. Uh, what he means by what what the scripture means by the world and the flesh, those who belong to the world will act like the world. And that's what is happening right now. People act like the world nowadays. And those who say yes to the desires of the flesh and those who say yes to Satan, these people will be naturally against those people who believe in God. So Jesus is sending these apostles and telling that you will be hated and persecuted, even killed. But don't be afraid because your soul is important. I'm also giving a warning. Why? Because don't think that body is not important or body is important. Thomas Aquinas even say that body is a form of the soul. That is why in the Catholic Church we respect the body. We bury the body in the cemetery, not cremate the ashes and throw it in the oceans. No. 
We believe in the resurrection of the body. So that is why in the passage also you will see, uh, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Wait a minute, your body is in, on earth, right? How will, he's talking about the resurrection of the body, everyone will rise and later you will be thrown into Gehenna according to the deeds or you will go to heaven. So that's a thing he's talking about. Uh, the body is a perishable shell. Uh, to, to understand it in simple way. And the soul that is immortal. You know, soul is immortal. It's one's real self. That's real self. But body is the reflection or, or the form of the soul. Other human beings can destroy one's impermanent body. But only God has power over life and death eternally. So be afraid of him. Be afraid of him in the sense fear of offending him. Do not fear other men and don't even fear Satan. O opposite things nowadays happen. People are afraid of Satan, not of God but have the reverent fear of God that leads to a righteous life and the fear of offending him. Satan's home is a fiery pit, or as Jesus calls Satan's abode Gehenna. However, it is also the place of final punishment for the lost souls who reject God's sovereignty and over which God exercises ultimate power and authority. Based on this reflection, my dear brothers and sisters, if you read the next verse, verse 29, Jesus gives this example. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even all the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Sparrows were the cheapest meat that one could buy at the market and were eaten by the poor people. They are worth hardly anything in material terms. And yet even the death of a sparrow is God's concern. And God cares. The point of Jesus' comparison between a person and a sparrow is if God cares for the sparrows that he created, then he will care even more about men and women who are his masterpiece of creation made in his image. So what Jesus is trying to say is God loves you and God cares for you. It's really good to remember on the Father's Day to appreciate how much God the Father who loves us so much that is the point of Jesus. Jesus says very clearly, even if you don't have a good father, you have the real father that is God the Father who really loves you. And remember, before the time of Jesus, people were scared of God. And God is the master. But now says, no, God is your father. He's Abba. He's your daddy. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants the best for you. Today, as we celebrate Father's Day, uh, I know how many of you know this, uh, Actually, it was a woman who initiated the Father's Day, <laughs> not a man. So her name was Sonora Smart Dot, in honor of her father. The first Father's Day was celebrated in June 19, 1910. Uh, remember, Mother's Day was celebrated even before 1908, uh, first time in Spokane, Washington. In 1972, only after so many years, 1972, President Nixon established a permanent national observance of Father's Day to be held on the third Sunday of June each year. That is why we are celebrating Father's Day this weekend. It is good to uh, understand and uh, read the importance of the role of a father in a family. This is going to shock many of you, but pay attention. I have attached the uh, entire article written by Christian Carter, PhD, in a uh, she works for a senior uh, fellow at the Greater Good Science Center. In this article, she explains certain role of a father. In general, kids, kids who have dads that actively participate in their care and that interact with them a lot more, more likely to be smarter and more successful in school and work. Be happier. Children with positively involved fathers are more likely to be happier and more satisfied with their lives overall. They experience less depression, distress, anxiety, and negative emotions like fear and guilt. Have more friends and better relationships. Children whose fathers are positively involved have better social skills. They tend to be more popular and better liked. They have fewer conflicts with their peers. They are also more likely to grow up to be tolerant and understanding, have positive interactions with their siblings, have supportive social networks made up of long-term close relationships. Number four, have happier, healthier mothers. When fathers are emotionally supportive of their children's mother, moms are more likely to enjoy a greater sense of well-being. 
In addition, supported moms are more likely maintain healthy pregnancy behaviors, an indicator that father's support increases the odds that both mother and baby will be physically healthy. Number five, and they are less likely to get into trouble or otherwise engage in risky behavior. This is a common, in generally you will see if you have a good father who is involved, the child is going to be good. Studies show that when a child has a good and involved father and mother, the child grows in a healthy maturity decisiveness. In other words, the role of a good father and a mother has a greater impact in the good life of a child. You know, it is so ironical. These signs, uh, these statistics, these studies come out when so many mothers by choice deny the role of a father. Unfortunately, not by chance, by choice. The responsibility of the father begins even before conception. This is a very interesting article. The Science of Dad and the Father Effect written by Joshua Ikrish. Once again, I've attached this uh, uh, entire article, so please read it. There is epigenetics, the study of changes in the expression of DNA, that is epigenetics, that are caused by lifestyle choices, the environment and other outside factors. While we tend to blame mothers for ruining the genetic information in their eggs with drugs and alcohol, until recently we had a little concept of how father's vices might impact their sperm. We now know that the decisions a man makes before conception can have lifelong impacts on his kids. Studies sh suggest that men who binge drink before conception are more likely to have kids with congenital heart diseases and who abuse alcohol. Poor dietary choices in men can lead to negative pregnancy outcomes. At least one study suggests that men who are stressed before conception may predispose their offspring to high blood pressure, uh, high blood sugar. In other words, my brothers and sisters, the study says that conjugal love the sexual act is a sacred act. It's a responsible act. Both have, have to be responsible. Here, when you are creating a baby, uh, you, you, if you are trying to use one person or another or a spouse or, or a woman or a man as an object, your child is going to be in trouble. So once again, it the science that brings back the Catholic concept of marriage here, the importance of marriage, the importance of the sacred sexual act. The reason why I pointed out is to understand the role of the father. The role of the father, qualitative role, is very, very important. It begins even before conception. But there are so many children who do not have good fathers and who are abandoned, who are orphaned. Uh, I remember a beautiful book written by Paul Witz, a psychologist, The Faith of the Fatherless, where he talks about atheism mostly caused by the fathers. If the father is absent, or if the father is abusive, or if the father is dead, the children are going to blame God, the father, for the mistakes of the earthly fathers. And so they are going to become an atheist because they are projecting their anger towards the earthly father uh, than uh, to, to God the father. It's a very interesting book. But today's gospel reading, Jesus gives us a medicine. And it's a very powerful medicine. He says, no matter what, whether you have a good father or bad father, you have one father who is really your father. That is, God is your real father and he really cares for you. And that belief that you have a good father will change you, will mold you, will make you better. That is why in the book of Psalms, chapter 27, verse 10, we read, Even if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me in. God will never forsake you. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, Can a mother forget her infant, be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even should she forget, I will never forget you. Jesus says, God will never forget you. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, we read, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you, a prophet to the nations. I appointed you. There are so many children who want the attention of the parents, attention of the father especially, that the father will know, will participate in a, in a, or in a, in a life. But, but Jeremiah says, God knows you. God knew you, right? Before you were born, before you were even conceived, God knew you. And in the gospel reading, Jesus says, God cares for you. 
So, my brothers and sisters, if you have a father who is absent, who is abusive, or who is dead, and I tell you, you have one father, God, who really cares for you, who loves you, will never forsake you, will always, always remember you, and he will never forget you, and he knows everything about you. And that belief that God cares for you will change your life. So believe that God loves you. Amen.